Yeah, hi, my name is Glenn Jickling. I'm a stroke neurologist at the University of Alberta. And this is uh, Serena Falcioni. She's a research scientist also at the University of Alberta. We have the pleasure today to be able to discuss uh, a paper that's come, in, come out in neurology on uh, endoluminal biopsy for molecular profiling of human brain vascular malformations. And, and we both thought it was quite interesting. It's a novel technique to be able to uh, sample brain cells um, brain endothelial cells using an endovascular catheter. And it has a number of implications in terms of precision medicine, being able to access uh, close to brain cells. It, it's always been desirable to get brain tissue, but um, in terms of studying human brain um, disease, but uh, it's been quite, it's an invasive procedure. And so this is close to the next best thing. It's uh, sampling endothelial cells from the luminal side of the vessel. So Serena, I don't know if you want to maybe share a little bit about what, what they did. Mm -hmm. Yeah, so um, like you mentioned, uh, it's a interesting study where they were able to actually retrieve endothelial cells from um, the uh, endovascular biopsy that they did uh, in AVMs in the brain. Um, and so I can share uh, one of the figures that they had from their paper here. Um, let me just make this full screen. Um, yeah, so as you can see, they were able to sample endothelial cells at, uh, they did this at two sites. And so they did it in the iliac artery and then in the brain AVM. And so they went in with a catheter um, and, and went in uh, the groin and then up into the AVM, into one of the leading arteries um, of the AVM and uh, inserted a coil through the, through the catheter. And as you can see in the, the third kind of frame here, they were able to uh, collect endothelial cells by leaving this uh, coil in place for about a minute and then uh, retrieving the coil back um, and then collecting the cells that, that uh, were attached to, to the coil. And so they went on, um, like I mentioned, they did this in the iliac artery and uh, in the brain AVM, and then were able to yeah, collect these cells and then um, went on to do RNA sequencing. So interesting uh, method in order to, to retrieve these cells in a, a patient um, without surgically having to, to remove the AVM. Um, in their study, they, they also did a surgical sampling. So the patients that uh, got this uh, endovascular biopsy done went on to, to have the AVM removed uh, via surgery. And then they also did RNA sequencing on those samples in order to compare the two um, to really see if this method would be a, a uh, viable option in order to Sample the sample the cells in patients, um, and potentially not have to have to do surgery or sample the cells in patients that maybe didn't need surgery at the time. Um, yeah, so uh, that's kind of what they what their their methodology um, and and uh, what what they what they did um, in order to characterize the, the endothelium at that site. Um, and they did this in four patients. So they had a relatively small uh, patient group that they were able to do this in. Um, but those patients were uh, relatively young patients and uh, varied in terms of their um, spetzler Martin grade. Um, yeah, do you have anything to add, I guess, about that, Glenn? And I guess, how did they get the cells off once they pulled the wire out? How did they get the cells off of the wire to do the RNA sequencing? Yeah, so they uh, they did they did a collection from from the wire. I think they put it in buffer and then they characterized those cells um, using flow cytometry to to ensure that they were sequencing endothelial cells. Um, and one thing that I guess is to note is of their patients, they had a varying cell pullout. So um, in the brain ABM, their, their cell pullout ranged from 14 cells to 600 cells. And so that was one thing that uh, I guess definitely needs to be, um, or I guess is a, is a limitation in terms of 
in terms of this method is whether that cell count can be um, either a bit more consistent or or if more cells can be retrieved as uh, definitely a low cell count is is hard to continue on with RNA sequencing. I guess another thing to note about the patients that they chose was uh, that they they did select for a, a lower risk patient group. So they included anyone who is over 18 years old and um, had unruptured AVMs, but they did include an, or exclude, sorry, anyone that had uh, a previously or current ruptured AVM, um, an AVM with the presence of high risk features and AVMs that were not to be treated with um, surgery. So since they wanted to do their endovascular biopsy and compare that to uh, the surgical, uh, or sorry, do the endovascular biopsy and, and RNA sequencing on those cells and compare it to the uh, RNA sequencing from their surgical sample, they, they did exclude anyone that uh, was not able to go on to, to surgical. Um, sampling. And so that's, uh, I guess, their patient group is, is um, a, a definitely a lower risk uh, group of patients. Yeah, I think that's uh, an important limitation. And if you're trying to understand sort of the um, understand molecular biology, what's going on in the endothelial cells that might, might put these AVMs at higher risk for rupture, in this cohort, it was a, a group of patients that were in the lower risk category. And so it's may, potentially some of the genes that are identified may not reflect those patients who are in the higher risk category. But I think probably done on purpose because you wanna make sure this is a safe procedure, at least when testing it out to deploy coils and then pull them back out. Uh, wanna make sure there's not a risk of rupturing the AVM or causing thrombosis, so. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I think it also uh, begs a question of whether this could be used in a higher risk patient um, or, or to determine, I guess, who the higher risk patients uh, might be before uh, AVM rupture, but um, definitely something that uh, I guess could be looked into more in the future. Um, so after they did their uh, sequencing, they uh, compared the, the RNA sequencing from the endo, endo uh, luminal biopsy that they did at the ABM uh, to the biopsy at the iliac artery. And they uh, identified 106 differentially expressed genes. So that's these red, um, these red points at the top here. And um, they kind of looked into what those genes, what pathways and uh, molecular functions were involved or those genes were involved in and, and found that there's a variety of, of um, pathways and molecular functions that, that uh, were reflected and um, that might reflect some sort of change uh, in phenotype of the endothelium at those sites. And so definitely, um, interesting to see the, the changes that, that they found in some of the, the pathways like uh, MAP kinase and, and, and thrombin sing signaling. Yeah, and I think this is comparing the brain endothelial cells from the AVM to the iliac endothelial cells. Uh, whether it's differences between brain endothelium that are specific to AVM versus just brain cerebral endothelial cells in general versus sort of iliac endothelial cells, I think is a bit unclear, but at least it's suggesting there's some differences that are present. Hmm. Yeah, that's a, that's a good point. Um, and I think looking more into, they did do some uh, PCR to confirm some of the genes that they found. And so um, getting a little bit closer to looking at the function of, of some of these molecules that were differentially expressed um, could, could uh, provide a little bit of insight into whether it's yeah differences in the site of sampling or or differences in um, function due to something else. Um, and then just to briefly also talk about um, the difference that they saw between the surgical samples versus their endoluminal biopsy. So. Um, they, like I mentioned, they they went up with uh, 
the catheter and did a sample at the AVM. And so this was in the artery leading to the, or a leading artery to the AVM. And um, then they went on and did a surgical uh, sample as well, uh, removing that AVM. And so they found uh, that about 83%, um, so approximately 6,000 of the genes between uh, the surgical sample sample and the biopsied sample were um, were the same, or they found overlap of of, of six thousand genes, and so in this uh, middle graph here, they show a good correlation between this endovascular biopsy uh, cells and the surgical cells, and so um, just suggesting that this might be a a yeah a different way to get a measurement of the, the endothelium or a, a, a describing the endothelium without having to do that surgical um, procedure. And so uh, that's uh, definitely interesting um, finding. And then uh, they also did uh, a sample of the, just in the surgical tissue, they looked at the RNA sequencing from the ar leading artery. So this is where they would have done the endoluminal biopsy and then um, a nidal sample and found that there was also good correlation. So uh, potentially this could, could replace the need for a surgical sampling in, in certain patients um, or suggestion that at least they're, they're quite similar in terms of the RNA that were the cells were expressing. I think it's a it's an interesting strategy to try to at least get some more information about what's going on in the human brain and and these AVMs, um, and 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 kind of a cool technique to be able to feed a catheter up and and pull some endothelial cells. I think it's important to highlight that it's probably not not a zero risk procedure, and so at the moment you probably want some rationale to go up and pull some of the endothelial cells out, I think there's, uh, there's a risk of either is causing ischemic stroke or, or perforation hemorrhagic stroke in doing this procedure. And so to say you're going to go in and do this procedure just to get a sample, I think is at the moment a bit unclear. Um, but it, it does seem to provide some interesting information. Um, and maybe by understanding sort of the relationship of endothelial gene expression in humans, you can get some better insight into these AVMs and what might predis be predisposing to rupture risk and, and, and maybe developing novel treatments targeting that. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I think that's definitely um, kind of the, the, the novel part of their study is, is uh, what you're mentioning, I think for sure. Um, looking into bigger patient group and uh, I guess just different patients um, would definitely provide some provide some better insight into that uh, whether it would be something that would be feasible in in a clinical setting and I think just uh, getting to I guess refining the technique to find out whether or not more cells can be retrieved or if there's a different way to to use those cells if only minimal amounts can be retrieved could also be um, somewhere to go moving forward. Yeah, yeah, I agree. I think it's, I mean, it's an interesting finding even that when you pull the catheter out, you're able to acquire some cells and these cells have some features that look like endothelial cells. That's, I think, even a novel finding. It's unfortunate there's only 200 or two to 300 cells. That's a, a small volume of cells to work with for RNA sequencing. It, it leads to very low low volumes of RNA or low concentration of RNA, which is hard to work with because the current detection, like with using nanodrop or um, bioanalyzer, it's below the that concentration of RNA from 200 cells would be below the concentration. So you're kind of going in sequencing blind in this ultra low RNA world. Um, but so yeah, I agree with you. If there's ways to enhance how much cells can be extracted that might help. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I think um, also looking a little bit more into what the functional outcome of that, uh, or I guess uh, looking beyond RNA sequencing to just to confirm the actual functional changes of the endothelium could also be helpful and, and could provide um, more information and, and potentially remove the need for RNA sequencing and all of in all of the patients that they would 
collect data yeah. from. Yeah, I think it, like other strategies to look at these cells, like single cell sequencing, um, is there, what is the heterogeneity of the cells they acquired? I know they, I think they looked at this marker CD31, which um, correct me if I'm wrong, but I think it's also in the other cell types, not just endothelial cells. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I think the the characterization of endothelial cells and and confirming that they're just looking at endothelium could could be um, yeah definitely I think a better marker could be could be chosen because uh, even in the figure that they provided there are going to be white blood cells and and other cells that are potentially attached to that catheter that also express um, CD thirty one so I think just due to the to the amount of cells they were able to retrieve it's um. It's a start, but definitely could be could be more, uh, or I guess cells could be characterized a little bit more extensively to to confirm to confirm endothelial changes. I guess another question that I had was: Are these endothelial cells that are adhering or attaching to the catheter are they representative of the endothelial cells that are in the brain, or are these maybe cells that might be damaged or or potentially dying that are able to detach from the vessel wall? I think that's a little bit unclear. It seemed like they had a similar gene expression pattern to the cells from the surgical brain tissue. Uh, so that might support they are, they're close to the same cell type that were, that are in the vessel wall. Mm -hmm. but further characterizing will help sort of better understand what these cells are that are being attached to the wire. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I think that's definitely a good point. And, uh, definitely potentially doing single cell or uh, uh, an additional um, analysis of the cells could, could be able to tease that apart a little bit more. Yeah, potentially other flow cytometry markers of endothelial cell features. Mm -hmm. hard, hard to work with just 200 cells. And I think getting them from the catheter suite to the lab is a challenge, especially keeping them alive and, and healthy enough to be able to stain and do the sequencing, so uh, an impressive feat on its own. I guess what I what are the implications for practice? I think at the moment it's probably it's still probably in the research world, but I think it it provides an interesting opportunity to sample endothelial cells, maybe not just in AVMs, but other conditions, uh, maybe an acute stroke or uh, cerebral aneurysms. Understand endothelial biology and human. It, it might be able to provide some unique windows into human endothelial biology that previously weren't really available. I think it still needs some refining of how, how are we going to do sequencing in real time to provide information? Would we have to do the, the coiling into the vessel, take the cells out, and then come back to the patient after a few days, understanding what's going, what are the molecular features of these cells? But I think it's a cool new direction. And I guess it's similar like the risk, the risk of putting a catheter up to brain is always a risk of perforating the vessel and causing ischemic stroke. It seemed to be lower risk. I think these procedures are, are, are not uncommonly done, um, but I think you want to have a good rationale to be putting a catheter up to brain. Um, so if it can give information of a novel treatment that might target or MAP kinase or one of the molecular pathways that might be altered in, and promoting ABM or ABM rupture uh, could be very interesting. Any other thoughts, Serena, that you had? Um, I don't think that, I think we touched on everything that I was um, hoping to address, but. Yeah, yeah, so I think exciting new direction and look forward to future papers on how these endothelial cell, cells sampled from um, uh, vascular, like endovascular procedure, but how that can change management and, and lead to future directions. So, so I thank you for your time and, and, and sharing this and thank you for the, to the neurology for um, allowing us to discuss this interesting paper. <laughs>